Hello and welcome to Explaining Rust Analyzer, a series where we try to understand how Rust Analyzer works internally, one subsystem at a time. So, uh, we are in the middle of uh, discussing the Rowan syntax library, uh, the underlying uh, library used by Rust Analyzer to represent syntax tree in uh, such a way that the representation is lossless, it contains all the white space, all the comments, and also in a way that this representation is robust, that it can represent arbitrary broken code, which uh, isn't necessarily Rust. So last time, uh, like as a reminder, we started with uh, writing our own small version of row one as mini row one. Uh, last time we not the last time, but then we looked into the implementation of green uh, layer in row one, where green layer, green trees are like purely functional immutable trees. But in row one, we try to write in a very efficient way. So we optimize allocations, we use unsafe, uh, we try to uh, pack uh, dynamically sized uh, structures into single allocation, all that stuff. Finally, uh, while doing that, we noticed a small optimization, uh, a small opportunity for an optimization in our caching layer, and uh, it turned out that uh, our caching layer was actually buggy. So we fixed uh, the caching layer and also then added our optimization on top. So today, uh, I want to start discussing and probably even finish discussion. I don't know. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the red tree layer uh, in row one. Uh, the actual API which you interact with, which uh, gives you parent links and access to the text. So uh, let's all look into it. Yep, so uh, like this green stuff is what we uh, looked at last time. Today, uh, we're going to look at this cursor. And again, like this cursor, uh, you can also, like I sometimes call it uh, red tree. Uh, sometimes I even call it a zipper. And uh, what this thing does is that it adds extra abilities to the functional uh, green tree we have. It stores, it doesn't store any additional data. The data is still this immutable green tree, but uh, this layer of cursors, uh, adds ability to go to the parent node and to uh, get absolute offset of a node uh, inside a file instead of just getting the node length. In green trees, getting the length is easy, getting an absolute offset is not. And I must say that this is like very complicated and it's like the most like scary bit in the whole of Rust Analyzer. Uh, so as usual, we aren't going to cover it in the details. Uh, I will have a separate lecture on uh, mutating API because what makes this way more complicated than it uh, could be is that this uh, syntax node layer also supports modification. Basically, when you're writing refactors, refactorings, uh, you need to modify syntax trees, like you need to add expressions, uh, remove statements, like rearrange things, add imports, all that stuff. And turns out that uh, editing immutable uh, syntax trees is, well, complicated because you cannot just change immutable tree. And uh, we use this Slava horrible trick to actually kind of like add mutation and aliasing back to Rust, uh, just so that we can have a nice editing API. And that makes things significantly more complicated. So with that in mind, uh, let's uh, look at uh, what's going on here. The core structure here is not data. Uh, this is private struct and publicly it is available via like this syntax node. So uh, syntax node is a public API. It is what we interacts with and internally it stores just a pointer into no data. And a node data is a reference counted uh, single threaded uh, bit of data. And uh, again, we implement reference, uh, reference counting ourselves because we don't uh, want to allocate the whole U size for count and because we only want to store strong count here. Because this is a single threaded thing, we use cell, we don't uh, need, uh, we don't need to use atomics, uh, which makes this way, way easier. We also don't have this dynamic allocation here, 
Um, so yeah, that's easy. So let's see what is stored uh, in our data. Well, first of all, it's like, again, uh, our usual count, uh, which tells uh, how many instances of the type are there. And last time we saw that by using these counts, we actually were able to debug this uh, horrible caching issue. Then there is reference count. Uh, then uh, there is a parent link to no data. Uh, and parent uh, might be optional. And yeah, uh, the reason that uh, like everything, like uh, the reason why a uh, reference count is inside a cell is obvious because we want to manipulate it given uh, shared references. The reason why everything else is in cell is, well, it's complicated, that's mutation API. We will cover that later. Like for now, just like ignore all the cells except for this one. So yeah, then there is a parent. Uh, parent is optional. And parent parent points to another node data. And this is an owning pointer. Again, uh, if you recall, uh, in the green tree, uh, parents own children. But in the red tree, the situation is reverse. Children uh, own parents. Uh, then uh, there is a uh, index of this node in the parent and uh... okay yeah that's, that's again like another complication uh, basically right now you can think that we remember index in the parent and also like absolute offset but offset becomes uh, complicated then the tree becomes mutable and uh... Finally, uh, we have a green, uh, and green uh, is either a pointer to a node or a pointer to a token. So uh, this is uh, different than in our mineral inversion uh, in that here for this layer, we don't like, we internally don't have different types for nodes and tokens. It's all just node data. Although uh, in the public API, we have syntax node and we have syntax token, and they both store just the same node data. So they just like statically, uh, statically enforce which uh, variant of the green they are storing. Again, green is stored using row pointers. And that's like the cool thing about this data structure in that if you imagine a red tree and green tree side by side, then each pointer, uh, each node in the red tree points to the corresponding uh, node in the green tree. The ownership relationship in green tree is top down, in red tree is bottom up. And the only owning pointer from a red tree to a green tree is the pointer from root. Uh, in other words, if uh, the parent is none, then this green is an owning reference. And when we destroy the parent, we need to uh, remove reference count on a green node and potentially delegate it. However, for all other nodes, uh, this pointer is not owning pointer. Uh, that is because each red node owns its parent. And the parent owns its parent, and uh, that goes up to the root. And the root owns the root of a green tree. And the root of a green tree indirectly owns uh, the green node, uh, which we were originally pointing at. So that means that while we are traversing uh, red tree syntax nodes, we do not actually need to bump atomic reference counts on the green tree. We can do this uh, we can do the traversal on a single thread and we don't incur any cross-thread communication at all, which is like kind of cool. Uh, okay, so now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss because I can try to explain how the internal implementation works, but unfortunately like the code for immutable and uh, mutable versions uh, is just written together. So I don't think we can, we will be able to understand what's going on uh, at this point. Yeah, let's let's just try to see at some free 
else let's let's let, let, let's see if like uh something like drop makes sense for us and if it does okay and if it doesn't then we just like skip internal implementation details for now again i'm not skipping all together i will be covering them like in a separate lecture is lecture it's just that i want to get through this like as quickly as possible uh cover kind of like the basics of rust analyzer and then start to dive deeper uh into various more complicated details again so uh let's like uh take a look for drop because it's interesting so syntax node Syntax node uh, is a pointer to node data, and it is an owning pointer. So uh, when we clone syntax node, we increment reference count for the data, and if uh, and uh, when we drop in one, we decrement reference count. If we decrement reference count to zero, we actually need to free the underlying green node data, and. Uh, we do this in an iterative fashion because uh, children own parents. So once we've freed a child, we might also need to free its parent. And yeah, like immediately we see like this if not mutable stuff, which is like scary. But you probably can ignore it. But yeah, so okay. Uh, we start with, with uh, converting uh, our own node from raw pointer to an owned value. Uh, such that this uh, node is dropped and the underlying memory deallocated uh, once we hit the end of this loop. Well, then we look at the parent. If we have some parent, we ignore some scary stuff, uh, and then we recursively decrement reference uh, count for a parent, and if it reaches zero, we continue to the next iteration of the loop, otherwise we are finished. If there is no parent, uh, that's where like interesting uh, thing happens. If uh, there is no parent, we know, then we actually own the green node. So here and only here, we need to deallocate the green node. I guess uh, the second interesting thing would be to look at is the constructor, where we do the opposite. We like uh, set up the ownership structure. So uh, we start with, uh, and yeah, by the way, uh, while uh, I was fixing uh, that uh, bug in the cache, uh, Lucas was fixing a horrible memory leak somewhere in this code. So yeah, like, uh, don't trust me explaining uh, this code because uh, when I wrote it, it was like buggy uh, in a pretty horrible way, which uh, wasted a lot of time of many people to debug it. But anyway, so yeah, uh, if we want to create a new data, we start with a parent, uh, if there is parent, and with a green node, and with uh, offset about our position, absolute position in the file. Index and offset. And okay, what's going on here? So first we create new node data struct, where we yeah, just forward everything. Then, scary stuff happens, which we can conveniently uh, fault. Uh, yeah, and finally, we uh, allocate ourselves into a box and return that. That actually doesn't seem too bad. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> okay, I, 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 I'm really not feeling well about like skipping like some crucial aspects of this code here, especially like this offset computation is like very, very important. So yeah, let me just like quickly, uh, like qu quickly uh, get to an actual API. So uh, one thing I want to mention here before we uh, go to the API is that uh, while green nodes has value semantics, Green nodes are equal, basically, if underlying text is the same, if and the structure of a tree is exactly the same. So like comparing two green nodes is like is a recursive comparing of all the children. For uh, syntax nodes, the situation is different. Here, the equality is based on identity. Basically, two syntax nodes are the same if they point to the same file, and we know that they point uh, to the same file if the uh, green nodes are the same, 
and if they share uh, the same uh, text offset. Because again, due to the duplication, the same green node might actually be present several times in the file, and the offset is how we disambiguate between uh, these possibilities. Okay, and like there is like this all sorts of horrible. Let me make the small the font smaller because. You see, if the stuff doesn't fit in, uh, if the line doesn't fit in the screen, that it's like probably too big a font. Okay, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's like the whole bunch of the API here, and the same for tokens, and like the same for syntax elements, and like basically like this goes and goes and goes for like one hundred lines, uh, one thousand lines. Anyway, uh, like complicated stuff. Uh, the nice thing is that if you want to understand uh, how to use it, you uh, need to look only at this API module, which is considerably smaller, and it doesn't contain any implementation details. It's just a wrapper around like this cursor, scary stuff, uh, and that's it. The reason uh, why we need this wrapper is because this wrapper adds an extra type parameter called language. And the language allows uh, you to do two things. First of all, it allows you to customize what specific type are you using for a syntax client. Because yeah, in row one, syntax client is kind of just like uh, U16. And you might want to use row one for like TypeScript and for Rust, and you want the syntax kinds of TypeScript and the syntax kinds of Rust actually be different types. So to do that, we add this like language parameter, which allows us to convert from this raw uh, U16 representation to types representation. Uh, one question here is, well, why do we need to do this? Why didn't we make a syntax kind itself a template parameter, basically? Uh, well, the reason for that is that I care about compile times. And I care that the code in reusable libraries is not generic, because if you make the code in library generic, that means that this code will effectively be compiled every time you use this library. And if you use this library in 10 crates of your project, that means uh, that the code will be compiled 10 times, uh, which is obviously not really great. So uh, all the actual code in draw one is non-generic. It is compiled while you compile row one itself. And this uh, generic API layer is just some stupid forwarding functions. So there isn't a lot of meaningful code to speak of here. Okay, so yeah. Uh, this language defines the conversion from syntax kinds, from raw syntax kinds to type syntax kinds. And also it requires uh, syntax kinds to be debug. And that allows us to implement a nice debug representation for syntax node. So for example, if you invoke show syntax tree in Rust analyzer, what you see here uh, is essentially, yeah, what you see here, yeah, like this code is exactly the code which produces this representation. It works the tree and like uh, prints the tree indented using the uh, debug input for syntax kind, like this is syntax kind, it's debug input, and then using uh, add sign, the text range, and for tokens, the actual textual representation. A cool thing here is how we actually do this, like this pre-order with tokens. It is like one of my most favorite APIs in the whole row one, so let's take a look at it. Well, uh, I'm actually pre-order with tokens. Uh, Let's cover the basic API first and then come back to pre-order because uh, it, it uh, needs uh, some more deep discussion. So, okay. Let's uh, quickly uh, look through the actual API. First, yeah, uh, you can take a green node and uh, create a syntax node out of it. So technically, green node is a public API. Uh, to get syntax node in the first place, you need to start with a green node. However, uh, this is like public API, which you use once in your library and you forget it. Uh, and in all the other cases, you just work with syntax node because syntax nodes, because they provide more powerful APIs. 
mm, you can get a kind. And yeah, uh, the kind you get by just looking at the kind of underlying green node. Yeah, there's like there's uncomfortable for me number of layers of indirection here, but well, uh, that's what you get when you try to make a reusable uh, syntax tree library. There is like this text range. And again, like text range is difficult because it is implemented differently for mutable and immutable trees. But important thing to stress is that it gives you absolute offset of a node in file. And in general, in Rust Analyzer, we have a convention that we always use file absolute offsets everywhere. Because yeah, like uh, if you use, you can always use like relative offset uh, inside the node or absolute offset in a file. And if you don't set a convention, then you will mess up. So uh, we always just look at the absolute offsets. Index is uh, the index of node and parent. And that's like horribly bad name should be renamed. A syntax text, uh, that's an interesting API. It returns, let me actually create a telegram so that I am not disturbed by notifications. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, syntax text is interesting. Uh, it, this could return a tree, uh, um, just a string. Uh, like semantically, this is a string, uh, but it doesn't do this actual allocation of a single continuous string. It, it's uh, the same textual data backed by the actual trees. Uh, we can get back the green data. Again, we return cow here because immutable trees are complicated. Parent returns optional parent. Uh, ancestors returns uh, like the chain of parents and implement. And uh, this is implemented in a trivial way where we just start the current node and repeatedly call the parent. Again, successors is uh, one of the methods which I uh, specifically wanted to have in Rust for Rust Analyzer, and I kind of like I don't think that I implemented it, but I definitely try to be very vocal on the issues about like, hey, let's actually stabilize it. Okay, uh, children goes through children which are nodes and not tokens, and children with tokens uh, goes through all the children, including tokens. Similarly. First child, uh, last child returns nodes. First child or token, last child or token returns node or token, which we call a uh, syntax element by convention. But syntax element is just an alias for an enum of node and token. Uh, next sibling and previous sibling returns siblings in this syntax node. So uh, that, that's actually important. If you... Yeah, let, let's say uh, we are calling some function like f123. Then the next sibling for two will be three. And uh, let's say this is like somewhere inside a uh, bigger function. So uh, we are looking at the next sibling of two. That would be three. If we look at the next sibling of three, that would be none because next sibling returns the sibling in the same parent. So although like the next syntax node in the file is four, it doesn't belong to the same uh, parent. The parent of three is this uh, function call. The parent of four is that other function call. So uh, sibling here returns none. Uh, analogously for tokens, uh, this one is interesting. So again, like. All those APIs were about direct children. Uh, this is about indirect children. So if you have actually, uh, let's just uh, look here. Yeah, so uh, we have like this function. And this function has a block expression as a body. And this block expression has an error curly child. So notice that this right curly isn't a child, a direct child of a function. It's a child of a block expression, which is a child of a function. But first token will, last token, will recursively go into children uh, to find like the last token. Uh, I, I, I guess, I guess it's way harder to explain this in words than to actually just like say what it is. 
Uh, and yeah, the implementation here is just like uh, curiously recursive. Uh, we curiously recursive. Okay, yeah. So to get last uh, last uh, child token, we get uh, last token and recursively invoke a last token on that. So we get like last direct child token and invoke last token on that. If that is, if last child token, uh, last direct child token is a token, we return itself. But if it, uh, but if it is a node, then we uh, drill down into this again. So yeah, that's like basically like, uh, these two are recursive. All the previous one were not recursive. Uh, siblings return direct siblings to the nodes. Uh, in a one or another direction. Again, siblings with tokens return uh, that same thing with tokens. Again, the implementation is very similar. And actually, like uh, while the stuff, like the underlying uh, data stuff, is like very hard, the implementation of these like high-level methods uh, is very straightforward, uh, very nice to read and write. It's just like let's write some iterator methods. So we start with like current token and like recursively call either next or previous method. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that every method which returns an iterator, so siblings, descendants, and ancestors, always returns the node itself. If you want to get exclusive ancestors, exclusive siblings, you need to explicitly call skip one uh, on the call side. Descendants. The sentence is interesting. It recursively uh, enumerates uh, all the children and children of children, etc., etc., and it uses this pre-order things, which uh, pre-order -pre thing, which I promised to uh, call about separately. So uh, let's skip this all for now. <laughs> yes, uh, token and offset. Uh, one of the basic operations uh, in an IDE, uh, when you uh, run something like go to definition. You start with a file name and a position in the file, and the first thing you know uh, you need is to figure out what's at this position uh, in a file syntactically. And the first step in that is finding the token and the position. And then you go from the token uh, through its ancestors until you find like an expression, function, or what you're interested in. So uh, this one we can actually read. I'm actually. Wait, are we. Yeah, uh, we somehow jumped at the cursor implementation uh, while we should have been in the API. Uh, but uh, kind of like, again, uh, the, AP, like the actual public API of cursor and API are pretty similar. And I think here, like, this is actually one simple method we can understand. So with, without speaking about mutability, or rather, without not speaking about mutability. So let's just do it. So okay, we want to find a token at a specific offset. First of all, uh, we better assume that the offset is within our text range because it is. if it is outside, then the user does something wrong. Like it tries to look up an offset in a file uh, which doesn't have this offset. This operation doesn't make sense. So this is a programmer error of the user. And that's why we assert here. And like, if it were documented, it would have a panic section. But yeah, uh, someone, probably me, will will write the docs uh, sometime in the future. Okay. So uh, if we actually an empty node, uh, when uh, then we know that there is no token uh, here. Oh, by the way, uh, like this token, uh, like the return type here is curious. The return type here is token and offset because there is actually three distinct possibilities uh, when you try to find token and offset. Uh, there might be no tokens if the node is empty. There might be a single token uh, if you are if uh, the position is right in the middle of a token, or if it is like the first token in the file or the last token in the file. But also, the cursor may be exactly between two tokens. And then like it's unclear which one is the token of what, uh, at offset you are looking for. So OK. Uh, if uh, the text range for our node is empty, then we know that there are no tokens. And it's interesting. Yeah, it's, that's actually kind of like really horrible. Uh, 
uh, in that I really want to make it invariant that no syntax node is empty. That tokens always that tokens always have non-zero lengths, and then the nodes always have non-zero lengths, and that almost works. And there is one very very annoying special case where it does actually break. If a file is empty, then that's the single case where the syntax node is empty. It doesn't have children, its length is zero, and you don't have any single token in the file. And that's, yeah, that's pretty annoying. One interesting uh, way to get around this is to say that each file cre uh, has a pseudo end of the file token. And then you can say that, hey, even an empty file has one token, which is end of the file, and you can return this token. But I'm not sure if that's uh, a good idea because, well, uh, then you need to store this. Uh, you, you still need to represent the token with a zero length. So I didn't do this. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, if the argument is correct and the file is not empty, uh, we need to find the actual token. And we do this in a stupid way, actually, because uh, this is just just a linear lookup in the set of tokens. Oh my god, that's that's uh, that's very bad. Like that's uh, yeah, that's like that's uh, that's recursive linear lookup. This should have used uh, binary search. And again, uh, if you're watching this and you want to contribute, uh, rewriting this to use binary search uh, would actually be a great contribution. Although like rather than trivial one, in a sense that. Uh, like the code is like not too difficult it's a bit fiddly uh but it might be hard to like make sure that the code is correct because there are no tests in the row in itself there are only indirect tests in rust analyzer and while uh they are usually doing a great job at surfacing issues they are not as good at like pointing out what exactly break because uh, if you make a bug and wrong one uh, you will see that like someone in the middle of Rust anal Analyzer breaks horribly and it might be hard to track that back to some change in syntax tree. Anyway, but uh, on the positive side, this uh, like bad uh, linear implementation is actually easy to implement. So we want to find a token uh, at offset. We just find all the children who might intersect, who might contain this token. And then there are two cases. So we might have like one or two children which might contain this offset. Because again, your cursor might be not only exactly between two tokens, but also exactly between two syntax nodes. Uh, so yeah, uh, if uh, there are two tokens, then yeah if you are two tokens uh we know uh two nodes we know that we are exactly in between the nodes so uh recursive uh, calls to token at offset will create will return on a single token and we can return the between result otherwise uh, we can just recurse the node and i'm curious what is the case? Oh, right, because uh, left to right are node, are not nodes. They are nodes or tokens. So, uh, like, token at offset for the token uh, just returns the token itself, making an assertion. Anyway, so uh, that's like the basically the API to get syntax token. Uh, at a position and once you get the token you actually can then use parent uh, input on this token to get to bigger syntax node at the offset uh, if you're starting not with the token but with the range uh, you uh, want to find uh, In the similar operation, you want to find the minimal uh, element which uh, covers this range. 
and yeah, uh, this I think is actually yeah, uh, th this is uh, correctly implemented using binary search. I wonder if we can implement coconut offset in terms of covering element. Yeah, it's not clear because yeah, like the documentation says that like if a range is empty and is contained in two leaf nodes, either one is returned. So there's the difference between these two APIs is that this API tries to be precise. If you put a cursor between two nodes, two tokens, two tokens are returned. Here, if you like asking for a cover and element for an empty range, well, you are doing a strange thing. You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and like we return something. I guess I wonder if we should just assert that range is empty is false not sure if that's a bad idea or a good idea i wonder what's the difference between shadow token and range and oh okay yes because like a uh, covering element uh, again is like recursive, and child token uh, looks only at the direct children. That's actually, yeah. Uh, I I really feel like we need some like better convention here to signify like because like it's not true that kind of like there is like two categories of methods. There is methods which return only nodes and methods which returns node tokens. And there is also methods which return like either direct um, children or methods which also return indirect like recursive uh, children. And uh, the first condition is always node or uh, like just something or something or token. But for the second distinction, we don't have such a great naming convention. That's really bad. Okay. So yeah, that's like hard methods uh, about mutability. So we ignore them. Again, method about mutability, ignore it. Uh, the API for syntax tokens is like simple. Again, like it's actually similar because we have the same kind, we have the same text range, we have the same index the text is simpler in the case of syntax nodes we return the syntax text thing here we can just return and line string directly we have parent we have ancestors or we have siblings and again like this next token is again like the recursive version of a sibling because it can return you not like if the sibling, uh, like basically siblings share the same parent with you. Next token and previous token doesn't necessarily return the token from the same parent. It can jump to a sibling of your parent. And if you start with the first token in the file and call next token repeatedly, you will uh, list all the tokens in the file. And the same API for syntax element. And the iterators and like various boring nipples. So. Uh, let's look at the things. Let's look at the pre-order and uh, let's look at the syntax text. Okay, so pre-order. Uh, this is an iterator of all recursive children. And a cool thing about this is that Usually when you write an iterator over a tree, you need to spend extra memory proportional to stack. Uh, like you cannot just return like an iterator. Uh, because yeah, because like when you're like iterating some deep node, you need to remember which node you need to return to. So uh, most of the time, Iterators of the trees store some kind of a stack internally. That's not true for row one trees. Uh, for row one syntax trees, we actually are able to do iteration using um, O1 extra time, using only constant amount of extra time. And the trick is uh, simple, uh, basically because all our nodes already store parent links. We can use uh, that uh, links 
to figure out uh, what to do next. So, <clears throat> Pyotr stores a syntax node and it returns, it yields a sequence of walk event. Where walk event is that we either enter a node or leave the node. Uh, when we start pre-order, we start with entering the root node, which we enter here. And by the way, like uh, this is somewhat confusingly called root in that this is a root of this pre-order. But this root might have a parent. And we need to remember it an extra variable because when we return back from this starting node, yeah, it probably should have been called just start rather than root. And more importantly here, start. Actually, this one is fairly uh, uncontroversial, so I probably should just commit this. Oops. Need to be on a branch to actually send a pull request. Okay. Why can't I just send a pull request? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's always a good time to make the name in better. So, uh, we start with a start node. And well, not necessarily like a start node, we just remember so that we remember where to stop because like start node and stop node are actually the same node. We start with entering the start node. And then, okay, uh, looking for next wasn't the best idea. And then, uh, when we call the next node, we check. If we are currently entering the node, and the node has some child, then we should enter first child of this node. Otherwise, we should leave the current node. If we are leaving this node, then if we are back at the start, we should finish. Otherwise, we should proceed to the next sibling. Uh, and we should enter the next sibling. If there isn't uh, uh, a next sibling, we should leave uh, not only us, but also a parent. So when you leave the last child of the node, you also leave its parent. And that's it. So that's like... Uh, Actually, surprisingly tricky logic. It like took me like some time to uh, cobble it together, but it does work. And using it, it's very easy because you just like write for now, then pre-order something, and like stuff happens. And uh, as I promised, uh, let's look at the display impulse. No, let's look at the debug impulse because display would be actually easier. So yeah, uh, as a reminder. This impulse uh, draws the stuff on the right. And the way we do it is that we take pre-order with tokens and every time we enter an element, we write the necessary amount of indentation and then we write the element. I wonder if I can just... This is the same, right? So why can't I just... Will this compile? Yeah, let's actually... I mean this for...
No pull request? Okay, should we send another pull request? Okay, yeah, something's, something's up with my uh, GitHub scripts anyway. Uh, no problem, I will try to figure this out later. Yeah, so yeah, then we like, write the actual element and finally we track the level. And that's why it's like useful to not like return just the nodes, it's useful to return both entry and exit events because uh, then we can do stuff like level track. And that's actually like basically like, the only thing uh, you need this for, like everything else would have like the same shape of like tracking some kind of a context while you are traversing the tree. An extra interesting feature of this API is that this pre-order has this skip subtree method, uh, which allows you to selectively skip sub subtrees. So if you call a next, uh, next method on a pre-order and you previously called skip subtree, then we reset skip subtree so you can skip other subtree and we just immediately leave the current node. Okay, so that was pre-order. And finally, the last thing I want to cover here was text. Okay, so, yep, syntax text is like just a text, uh, but it uses the actual syntax tree to represent the data. It also has like this ability to take a slice of syntax text. So we also store a range inside the syntax now. So semantically, syntax text uh, is, this might be a comment. Yeah, so uh, this is what we represent here. And that's like just a bunch of various methods to implement basically what is text and yeah uh, i guess for each chunk is probably the most interesting method because it just like iterates every string token in this tree and internally trifold chunks oh my god i was i was very high on functional programming when writing this it seems so, yeah token with ranges which returns the iterator of tokens which interacts which intersects this original text range and probably yeah it returns like the sliced relative range of the token which we actually should use and here yeah we like take the token text which is just a string and then we slice it by range and uh return stuff so yeah I guess that's mostly it. Let's, let's look at the uh, public API again to understand if we know everything. So uh, syntax node, syntax token, syntax element, uh, syntax node children, syntax element children language. We covered that right now. That's like this nice APIs. Green children, uh, not builder, not token data, green token, green token data, we covered uh, the last time. Syntax text was just now, utility types. So token at offset we talked about, walk event we talked about, no token, we have been looking at it for like three videos already, and direction I just mentioned, like next in pref. And that I think it's, that's the whole of the Rowan API. And again, I guess, I guess the, like the main idea here, the bottom line, like besides those like robust and full fidelity and lossless parsing is that you have a syntax node, which has the parent method call, which is on the parent syntax node and uh, it has like the children method, which returns the iterator of the children, and you get an API for a syntax tree where you can navigate from any node to any other node using very convenient methods, using owned data. Yeah, by the way, like I haven't spelled this explicitly, but everything is cheaply owned data uh, because those are just non-atomically reference counted uh, objects, so you can, can clone them 
uh, however you like. This won't cause any performance problems. Yeah, and like you get all these like nice traversals, all these like intuitive and simple methods like text and like range and kind and yeah, actually kind of like like the, the core API is like very, very simple, like basically kind, text, parent, children. That's it. Uh, to implement those core APIs, you need to spend like a lot of code to like manage those like two green trees with like pointers and like unsafe and all that stuff. And on top of that row APIs, you can implement a lot of like fancy stuff like pre-order or syntax text or whatnot. But yeah, that's it. And I guess actually, yeah, I guess actually that's, that's a big point. That's a big point that this API is like really great. Why it is great? Because again, the actual core API is very simple. Things like pre-order and all that are just derivatives. The primitive, uh, the primitive API is just get the kind, get the range, get the children, and crucially get the parent. In this API, the two hard parts are get the parent and get the text range. Everything else is trivial. This API is very narrow. It's very small, very simple. It's narrow waste. That said, this API hides a rather advanced data structure inside with a very interesting complexity properties. It stores like this purely functional tree, uh, which actually stores parent pointers and absolute offsets, uh, which is like horribly complicated inside, but again, it is encapsulated behind a very small API. And on the other side, given this small API, you can implement a lot of very cool convenience methods. Uh, you can write like this, those are primitive operations. And out of them, you can compose very powerful higher level primitives, like this pre-order traversal, which spans only a constant amount of stack space, but allows you to traverse the syntax tree and even like to skip subtrees. So yeah, I guess this finally concludes our series about the syntax uh, of Rust Analyzer, the syntax trees. And the next time we will probably start looking at how we actually parse Rust text source code into these syntax trees. So again, uh, thank you for listening and see you next time.